All right. So we're Thank starting. You. That with... was really helpful last oh, time when you did that. Cool. Yeah, I, I almost forgot, and and you're welcome. And yeah, I meant to meant to do really could have been doing that from day one, but anyway, good. Because uh, yeah, we cover a lot of stuff, and uh, to be able to go back and and then you can pause it and you make it close captions too. Or sometimes it takes a uh, YouTube a, um, a few hours to get the closed captions in there, but uh, you know I like I like having captions on too uh when i watch things so anyhow this particular bone we definitely know it's a long bone um so we've but yeah is it a humerus is it the upper arm bone is it the thigh bone or the femur so one way to tell the difference is by this big rounded knob at the end this is called the head of the humerus and and the head of the humerus is very similar to the head of let me hit my cursor here let me scroll down and there's the femur so you can see you know they're very similar the only thing that's a little bit different uh, so we have uh, we have them right next door to each other here but uh, you can see they both have this big rounded knob at the end and that's called the head now the femur is going to have a more distinct neck so you can see uh, this is what they call the neck of the femur the the whereas the neck of the of the the humerus you know doesn't really exist <laughs> it's very, pretty scrunched down so these are what we call the ball so it's kind of a, a lead in to a little bit of articulation or joint talk so we have what's called a ball and socket joint forming the shoulder and forming the hip so uh this this is the ball of the ball and socket joint that forms your shoulder. So this would be the proximal end uh, of the humerus. And then we see a, a similar thing with the femur, another kind of ball-shaped structure, again, called the head uh, of the femur. And that's going to form the ball and socket joint of your hip. So, but again, the difference between the two, definitely we would, and the femur is much longer, certainly than, so if we were, again, in two dimensions, it's kind of like, uh, but, uh, you know, in class next week, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at some bones and we're going to, all of this stuff we've been doing last week and this week, next week, we're going to see bones and we'll touch them and look at them and, and you'll, you'll be able to see the, some of these bony features and distinctions. Uh, that you don't really are, aren't able to see. I mean, from this picture, it looks like all five of these bones are the exact same length. So again, it doesn't really help all the time to do stuff in two dimensions, but we'll work with what we have. So now let's, let's focus. So that's, that's going to be your distinction between the upper arm and the upper leg or the, the, the humerus and thigh bone or femur. So now how do we tell which bone this is? Well, one, a couple of things. We have this, this head here, this ball. This is going to be, first of all, it's proximal, right? We know this is toward, the, the plugs into the shoulder, but we also know that it's going to be a little bit medial. So this ball part, the big rounded head, that's going to be on the medial portion of the bone. So then if we travel down the shaft, we also call this the diaphysis, the shaft portion we can see that we're still on the medial side. And what we end up with here is, is what's called the medial epicondyle. And so we're looking at, at this image and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the distinct feature. So how do I know if this, if this plugs into my right arm or my left arm? Well, we're on the medial portion. Now this is gonna give it away. And again, these are, these are only two dimensions blow it up a little bit and we will see this next week but the pen's kind of pointing there there's a this is a really big groove or a depression and in in bony landmark terminology we use the word fossa so this is some sort of fossa or groove or depression and this fossa or groove is where the elbow or the ulna is going to plug in so the ulna plugs in and forms the elbow. Now the elbow I, is at the, the posterior portion of the bone or of the, of the joint or of the humerus, right? So this, this elbow joint is gonna be in the posterior aspect, right? When, when I'm in correct anatomical position. 
So this is called the olecranon fossa, letter G. Olecranon is uh, the fancy word for elbow. So we're looking at a posterior view. Be and I know, so, so first of all, we determine, okay, we've got a ball that's going to be medial. So this is the medial portion. Now I need to determine, am I looking at the front of the bone or the back of the bone or the anterior posterior? And so this groove is always going to be on the posterior aspect. So if this is the posterior aspect and this is the medial aspect, this would plug in to being my right humerus. Okay, so this would be the right side humerus because again, you would have the ball plugging into the body. So this is toward the body. And then we're looking at the back of the bone or the posterior aspect. And so we plug right into the right side. So we'd be look, we're looking at the back of the bone. And then we flip it around and we have the head is still in the same place. It just flipped over because now we're looking at the front of the bone or the anterior aspect. So this is still medial. And then this is still medial. This is that medial epicondyle, letter C. Okay. So this is still, it's the same bone. We just flipped it around. So again, now we're looking at the anterior portion and you could see, again, this would plug in to the right shoulder if we're looking at it from the front. And then F is what they call the lateral epicondyle. Okay. Now E and D, these are com in combos, they're called condyles, C-O-N-D-Y-L-E, okay. condyles. The lateral one, letter E, you want to relate that to the lateral forearm bone, which is going to be the thumb side, which is going to be the radius. So letter E is going to fit on top of the head of the radius. And the head of the radius is kind of a, has a kind of a groove or a depression in it. Um, so this is called the cap or the capitulum. Okay, the cap fits on the head of the uh, radius. So this is the capitulum, C-A-P-I-T-U-L-U-M. And then this letter D is going to be this chunk right here. See how it's on the medial portion? Medial portion. So letter D there, that's going to fit with what we call the trochlea or that is the trochlea, that's gonna fit with the ulna. Okay, so ulna and trochlea go together. Okay, so trochlea is letter D, T-R-O-C-H-L-E-A, trochlea and capitulum. Okay, so good, so that's your humerus. We're looking at the right humerus bone. Uh, let's see. Name the long bone. Um, so we have five long bone or six, two, four, six. Oof. All right, so we have, this has got kind of a, a U shape. This forms your elbow right here. This is the olecranon process here. But this, again, next week in class, when we look at this bone, um, it forms like a U shape. So that's how I always remember. This is the ulna because it has a big U at the end, it's like, it, it kind of spells it's like U, and then you have a big L here. So this is the ulna. Okay. And then this one is going to be your lower leg, uh, lateral lower leg bone. So this is going to be what we call the fibula. So um, this is non-weight bearing. We didn't, oh, what I was going to say is last week, we kind of got cut off at the 140 mark. Um, I think we were just about done with the lower uh, appendicular skeleton where we did the legs. So anyway, this bone is the lateral of the lower leg bones. It's called the fibula. So, and this little bump down here at the distal portion, distal lateral aspect, this is what forms that hard kind of what, what we call the ankle bone or your patients will call the ankle bone. 
right on the lateral portion of your of your ankle region you can palpate that big bump right that is actually your fibula it's not your ankle right remember tarsals are ankle so your heel your calcaneus is one of your ankle bones so your heel is an ankle and your ankle bone is a is a is a your fibula on the lateral side okay? and on the medial let's move over to number five so this is fibula number five is the other bone of the lower leg this is called the tibia and the tibia has a a, a distal big bump Okay. This is called the medial malleolus. Malleolus means little hammer, basically. Okay. Oh, I thought I could. I was trying to see if I could, if if Zoom had like a little dot type thing. I know like Google Slides and some of my other presentations, I have like a little dot, but yeah, this cursor is kind of tough to see. But anyway, this is called the medial malleolus. That's the other ankle bone on the, the inside of your lower leg or the, the medial portion of your lower leg. Your, it's your shin. This is your shin bone this is the weight bearing so fibula is non-weight bearing so if you broke your fibula you could be in a walking boot and uh, you'd be fine um if you break your tibia that's a little trickier uh because that's where all of your weight bears down uh, on the tibia and then on to your tarsals or your ankle bones so anyway this is the medial portion of your shin bone or of your ankle bone so this would be your left, not that you need to know this, but uh, as a side note, this would be your left tibia. We're looking at the an at an anterior front view. And then if this is on the inside or the medial portion, then this would spin it around and it would fit right onto our left shin or our lower left leg. So anyway, two and five are your lower leg bones. Um, three we looked at earlier, that's your femur. And again, it's distinguished by, it's, first of all, in person, it's huge. It's a, a really big bone. Um, so uh, diameter, length, it's, it, it stands uh, alone uh, in that. It's very evident in person. But it's got a big head and a big neck, uh, a long diaphysis, and then two big knobs at the distal portion. We're looking at uh, the anterior or the front portion. This would be toward the midline, right? It's angling in towards the body. So this would, the whole side would be the medial portion of the femur. So this would be a right side femur that we would be looking at. Okay, and then we, we did a, a, a humerus a little bit ago. And again, this one's kind of hard to tell which side it is. Let's go up back up here. So to me, it looks more like we're looking at this kind of stuff at the end than this, because remember the back or the, the posterior distal portion, that's just going to have one kind of big groove, whereas the anterior portion, you have a lot more distinct features. Okay, you've got the capitulum and the trochlea and this trochlear notch. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm seeing here. It looks like I've got a capitulum and a trochlea and a trochlear notch. So this is an anterior view. This would be the same bone. This is the right side. Not again, you don't need to put that in, but um, that's what it is. And then this is going to be your radius. And again, this isn't a, a great picture. One thing about the radius, this is the distal portion that forms the, a pretty big portion of the, uh, again, it's going to be thumb side is radius. But yeah, this big kind of wrist area, the distal portion, that's going to be radius. And this is pretty large. And then up here, it doesn't show it real well, but this is kind of concave. It's a big groove. And that's what fits in uh, to this, uh, what we call the capitulum. So the, the cap fits on the head of the radius. Okay, so that's what's going on with those bones there. And again, you're looking at a right side uh, femur. Oh, the, the sacrum, or not sacrum, the uh, the os coxae or the hip bone, the pelvic girdle, it's oftentimes called. We have the, the large portion, the ilium. And then this is called the iliac crest. This is the crest of your hip bones. 
And now this is going to be, uh, so, so in order to determine, am I looking at a left side or a right side? Uh, first thing we notice is that the pen is pointing at this big groove. That's going to be what we call the acetabulum, A-C-E-T-A-B-U-L-U-M, okay. acetabulum. And that's the socket for your hip where your the head of your femur plugs in. So this is going to be a, a distinguishing mark and, and to determine what side we're looking at, because this is going to have to be lateral. Okay, so this is facing outward or laterally. So then we have to look at the, the shape of the ilium to determine if this is the left side or the right side. So uh, this big groove is, is going to be your determining factor of uh, whether you're looking at the, the, the uh, anterior or posterior aspect. So is this the front or the back, or is this the front or the back? Well, this big kind of groove here is what they call the sciatic. You guys have probably heard of sciatica. Um, sciatic, uh, sciatica is not a town in upstate New York, although it might be, I don't know. But I do know that sciatica is a, is a, is a really uh, painful uh, condition of the lower back. It radiates down into the, 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 the backs of the legs, oftentimes maybe travels all the way down to the, to the uh, feet. So uh, if you, you know, some of our patients have some sciatic nerve issues, that's a bundle of nerves uh, toward the backs, right? So posterior. So this big kind of number seven uh, looking shape here, or arrowhead shape, this is the sciatic notch. This is gonna be in the posterior aspect. So this bump back here is posterior. So this whole portion up here is gonna, or over here on the right is gonna be the anterior aspect. So this is facing toward the front and this is facing laterally. So we know this would be the right side uh, hip bone. Okay. Uh, B is uh, the ischium and this is specifically the ischial Tuberosity, this is basically your butt bone, they call it. And then D is the pubic bone, or the pubis. This is a, the O foramen, obturator foramen. Again, you know, in the real world, it's, you know, it's good to know the sciatic and where it travels. And then, of course, the pubic bone and the, the butt bone uh, and, a, and your, your main hip bone. But, you know, the bony landmark stuff, that's again, you know, if you're going to go into orthopedics, you would definitely need to know all of that. But if you're not going into orthopedics, you know, I think knowing uh, bone names at the very least and uh, bone location is, is very helpful for, for all clinicians. Okay, um, let's see. I really only need you to know uh, two. Okay, so remember when we look at the wrists, we had eight carpal bones in each wrist. You don't need to know the specific names of those. I think knowing that there are eight of them in each wrist and that they're called carpals, that's probably plenty. Uh, now, this letter C is pointing, it wants to know the name of this big, this group of bones. These are called tarsal bones or ankle bones, okay, tarsals. Uh, letter A is the heel bone. We know that as the calcaneus in the clinic, C-A-L-C-A-N-E-U-S, calcaneus. It's calc, uh, calculator, uh, calculus. Calc uh, in the old days, uh, Latin means stone, so or rock. So, you know, they used to do math back in the, the old days. Uh, they used stones or rocks to count and you know, barter system and, and, and that. So calculating and calculus and calcaneus, that all stems from uh, the Latin for rocks. Just as a side note, I think it helps sometimes to link some of these oddball words with, you know, maybe what they, their meaning is or where they come from. Because, you know, all of our English words, well, all of them, probably 85% of our English language is either Latin or Greek derived. So knowing some of the basic terms of in A and P that we go through that will help you maybe understand other uh, terminology that you're faced with throughout life. Anyway, or it's just good for trivia 
if nothing else. Uh, what is the name for B? This is what they call the talus bone, T-A-L-U-S, a talus bone. That's like a talon uh, of, you know, like a raptor or a hawk or something, but talus. So the distal uh, tibia uh, articulates with the talus. In other words, your shin bone comes down and rests right on top of, of this talus. So all of the weight of your body is actually distributed right onto this talus. And then what happens is it spreads to three spots. It radiates to three different spots where we make contact with the ground. Of course, the calcaneus. And then we have the distal portions of uh, the first and fifth metatarsal bones. So uh, D is going to be, as a group, is called metatarsals. And then E, of course, are the phalanges. Okay, we'll talk about joints next, and then we need to go through muscles today. And then next week, I don't know if we maybe we'll, I don't know if we'll dissect or not. We, I think we'll probably have time. Anyway, but I do want to show you some bones next week, uh, disarticulated bones uh, and articulated. I have a, a, skele a couple skeletons. And then I have bones separate from the skeleton. That's okay. Um, and joints we'll talk about now. So we'll leave that open. We may come back to that one. I'm gonna share my other screen. All right, we'll try a visible body uh, for joints if it's giving us issues, uh, slowing the slowing the train down. Then we can we can always could, uh, try something different. Okay, good. Looks like you guys are all signed in to visible body. Let's see. Hmm. Here's what I'm going to do instead. It's on mine. It's already given me like, problems. Let me try and go back with, with bones. Let's see. I think I put some joints stuff in here. All right. Everything. So I'm going to close visible body. Because that, that's what I mean. It's like it slows down uh, other stuff that you're trying to do. There we go. La da do 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 do. Okay, here we are. Check it. Okay, I'm going to pop up the slideshow or watch a slideshow. All right, so articulations or or joints. Okay, looks like a couple fell out, came back. Okay, so the fancy word for joint is articulation. You've, you know this, you've all heard the word arthritis and arthritis, uh, A-R-T-H-R, uh, it means joint. And that actually comes uh, or kind of equates to the word articulation. So 
Uh, arthritis is an inflammation of an articulation, as in, in essence. So, uh, but we use the word joint, it means the same thing. A joint is a, and it's shorter, articulation. Geez, really? Articulation. Five syllables. Yeah, that's a mouthful versus joints. One syllable. So, but I think that must be what happened there. Like, gosh, this is getting tedious. Uh, this is, uh, uh, uh. So anyway, uh, a bone and another bone. So two different bones meeting together is considered to be a joint. So we can classify joints uh, either structurally or uh, and and function. I should say either or. It's it's an and. We function. We classify joints as structural and functional classifications. Now, the, so these go together. Each you see there are three structural classifications, three functional. So fibrous. Uh, and synarthrotic go together, cartilaginous and amphiarthrosis go together, and then synovian diarthrosis or diarthrotic go together. So fibrous and synarthrotic. Fibrous is the structural aspect. It just tells me we're dealing with a bunch of fibers. Oh, well, that's pretty straightforward. What types of fibers? Probably collagen. Collagen provide, or generally in the body, if you hear the word fiber, on the, whether it's on the cellular level or whatever level it might be, um, fiber is is a protein, okay? And the protein is more than likely collagen, uh, but we have other protein fibers too. Um, we have elastin, of course, uh, is a big one. But those are the two big dogs. So anyway, we're probably, so the fibrous aspect is protein and it's going to be very, tough and it's uh so it provides a lot of strength is what i'm getting at uh functionally uh these joints are immovable they're considered to be immovable that just simply means uh that uh you're they're they're not quite fused together but pretty darn close to being fused okay so we call that sin arthrosis s-y-n and then we see Arthur in there, A-R-T-H-R. -R, so that tells us we're talking about a joint or two bones coming together. And then the sin part, sin means with, right? Like in sync, uh, S-Y-N uh, or same, right? Like a synonym is the same word uh, meaning. Okay, so S-Y-N. So this means like same joint or uh, uh, together joint. Okay, so immovable is what we consider that to be. Fibrous, synarthrotic, immovable. Examples of those would be sutures are, are the prime examples. So the sutures of the skull, where each of the skull bones meet. Secondly, we have cartilaginous. So we're dealing with cartilage. So um, fibrocartilage specifically, but uh, so we have fibrous, lots of fibers, all fibers. Then we have fibrocartilage or cartilaginous joints. These are going to form like discs, like your intervertebral discs or the pubic symphysis. And then we also have the amphiarthrotic aspect. So cartilaginous joints are not immovable. We say they're slightly movable, like an amph amphi has to do with partially or slightly uh, or either uh, so like, a, like an amphibian can live in or out of the water. So uh, an amphitheater. So anyway, this means that we have some movement, but not free movement, total uh, range of motion. Okay, so cartilaginous, amphiarthrotic. And then lastly, we have what are called synovial joints. And those are diarthrotic or diarthroses. Uh, so two, right, di has to do with two, uh, oftentimes. So two bones uh, forming a joint. Uh, and these are freely movable. Synovial, you could uh, you see the word ovi, which means egg, and, and the egg is kind of like a capsule. So synovial joints have a, a capsule. There's another kind of term in here I see, uh, O-I-L, again, V and A, you get rid of those, you got O-I-L, that means oil, uh, or not means oil, that spells oil, but uh, synovial joints have fluid inside of them called synovial fluid. It's kind of like an oily, uh, slick substance that allows for a uh, uh, smooth uh, range of motion, smooth movement. Okay. Okay, so we'll look at 
those in a little more detail. So there you go. Fibrous joints, synarthrotic, immovable. Uh, three specific ones uh, that we see. One is called a syndesmosis. Um, we see this between like the uh, ulna and radius and the, the tibia and fibula. Okay. Um, and then the sutures, which I mentioned earlier. And then a gomphosis, that's the joint uh, of your teeth meeting your mandible or maxilla. So we can see a syndesmosis right here. It's also known as an interosseous ligament. Yeah. A lig By the way, joints oftentimes are going to involve ligaments because remember, a ligament brings a bone and another bone together, usually provides, again, uh, a stability uh, of the joint. Okay. And then you see the tib-fib area there. And then we look at the suture lines. You have, uh, again, a lot of fibers in there. And then a gomphosis where the teeth meet uh, uh, the uh, mandible or maxilla. Okay, cartilaginous or amphiarthrotic joints. We've got hyaline cartilage uh, between articulating bones. Uh, and then we've got fibrocartilage uh, connecting bones in the form of a pad or a disc. So a synchondrosis and a symphysis. So we'll look at, at those. So a synchondrosis, we can see um, where the ribs meet the sternum. Again, these joints are not immovable. Thankfully, we, we do need some movement, uh, which reminds me to take a deep breath, right? Every time I see, uh, see the thoracic cage. So it's good to take a deep breath, uh, a diaphragmatic breath from time to time. And it hits the reset button, but it's good that these are slightly movable because we, as the lungs expand, as we're filling them with air, we do need uh, the rib cage to expand with it. So we do get some elevation and some kind of lateral movement uh, of the ribs and uh, rib cage as, and the sternum as we uh, do our inhalations. Hey, and then before we're done growing, you know, when we're in the womb and we're, we come out of the womb, the first, you know, several years, 12 to 20 years of our lives, we're still growing. So we do see, again, kind of this epiphyseal plate formed uh, with hyaline cartilage. So again, considered a synchondrosis, but uh, uh, more trivial probably than anything. Now, the other type of cartilaginous joint, the symphysis uh, or the symphyses, so this is plural, one is a symphysis, multiples are symphyses. So the pubic symphysis, in between the pubic bones, you have a, a slightly movable joint there, which is great, especially in a pregnant mom who's getting ready to deliver a baby. It's good that this can stretch out a little bit and allow for more freedom of transport of the baby through this pelvic inlet. Lastly, the intervertebral discs. And again, these are fibrocartilage. So these intervertebral discs are types of cartilaginous joints. And then lastly, generally, when uh, whenever you've heard the word joint or articulation, probably thinking of like the shoulder or the knee or the elbow or the ankle, those are synovial joints or freely movable joints. We also call them diarthrotic. A lot of structures. Um, first and foremost is the capsule. That's where you get that ovium, uh, means egg. Okay? So it's kind of like a capsule. And that capsule has a membrane, uh, a couple of membranes actually. And then uh, can again, keeps everything contained. Then we have what's called articular cartilage. Articular cartilage is found at the ends of bone. It's where, where the, the two bones articulate. So at the distal and proximal ends of bones, you're going to find articular cartilage. And then the, the capsule surrounds uh, the, the ends of the two bones that are coming together. And we get what's called a joint cavity formed out of that. And then we also have in some of these, not all of them, but uh, several different uh, synovial joints. We have what are called uh, menisci, or one would be a meniscus. Um, we, this is most commonly associated with the knee joint. Uh, there are a couple little articular disc pads. They look like you know little gummy sabers or something like that. They're nice and smushy, squishy, uh, kind of circular pads. 
that uh, help with shock absorption primarily. And then we have ligaments, which again, provide stability of the joints. Uh, and then the a bursae, or, or this is a group, right? Vertebra is one, vertebrae is multiple, bursa is one, bursae are multiples. These are little sacs. Okay? These bursa sacs are gonna be responsible for uh, reducing friction when we have movement going on at a joint. So when we look at a synovial joint again, we can see uh, we've got this joint capsule here, and then um, we've got some uh, a synovial membrane. Pardon me, it must be lunchtime or nap time. Okay, so synovial membrane. And then within that synovial uh, capsule or that joint capsule is going to be synovial fluid. And it keeps the, it keeps everything lubricated. Now, oh, and again, this is going to be articular cartilage. This doesn't show, but menisci uh, oftentimes are found, in, especially in the knee. And I've got a, a knee coming up. It generally, uh, blood supply to to the inside of a synovial capsule is limited. So we do get uh, some nutrients delivered either via the bone pathway, uh, or you can see there are some uh, blood vessels located within uh, some of this ligamentous material, uh, and some of this soft tissue. So we can kind of get nutrients in there. The reason I bring that up is because in order to get tissues healed, you need to have a blood supply because blood delivers nutrients, it delivers all of the special uh, chemicals as well as structural aspects to be able to repair and promote the repair of tissue damage. You know, if we have tissue damage inside of a joint capsule, it, uh, the healing process can be very slow, uh, almost non-existent potentially. So um, they developed arthroscopic surgeries to be less invasive when I have uh, some tissue damage inside of the capsule. So if, if a meniscus is, is a little bit shredded or if I've got some articular cartilage that's that's got issues, we'll look at the knee, has a couple specialized ligaments called the ACL or anterior cruciate ligaments and posterior cruciate ligaments. Those two ligaments oftentimes get torn and, and severe knee uh, injuries. So the body won't heal those generally on, the, on, on its own because of the limited to no blood supply to the capsule. So arthroscopic surgery, I can make a couple small incisions, run a camera in there, run a little vacuum cleaner in there to, 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 to get it, whatever it is I'm snipping out of there. And then of course, a little pair of snips so they can get micro snips and kind of buff that up and clean up any of the debris and then vacuum it out and kind of watch all that going on with my camera and pull everything out and stitch you back up. And you might have three little tiny uh, scars uh, where we went in and you should be good to go as opposed to cutting the whole thing open. And you know, that creates even more problems usually because anytime you cut something, you're creating uh, extra scar tissue. All right, so when we look at different types of synovial joints, again, I don't want to belabor this too terribly much, but we do have what are called uniaxial. So basically, you're only dealing with one axis of movement. So like the elbow just bends, uh, opens and closes basically like a door. So that's a hinge joint, for instance. And then biaxial joints, you have like the thumb. Uh, instead of just, you know, if your fingers generally just open and close, they're almost like hinge joints, but the thumb, it can do extra things. It's what they call a posable thumb. So it forms like a saddle joint there. And then multi-axial, those are the most common. Those are the ball and sockets, the shoulders and hips. Those you get the most range of motion. So here's a, a little image or illustration, I should say, of uh, some examples. Again, in the elbow, you've got the hinge joint. And then, oh, going back to our where we started, you've got the, the dens of the axis against the rotating atlas. So the dens sticks up and then the, uh, of the axis, and then that atlas that sits on top of it can do some rotation. We also see this where the radius and ulna articulate with one another in that proximal uh, aspect. Okay, biaxial, this is that saddle joint I just mentioned. 
uh, in the carpo metacarpal joint of the thumb. And by the way, most joints, these movable joints, the synovial group, most of them are named for the bones involved. Not always. You know, how do we name joints? Well, an easy way to do it is just kind of combine the two bone names that are involved. So uh, I could call the elbow joint the humero humerus ulnar joint, humero ulnar joint. Uh, the thumb, I could call it the carpo metacarpal. So the, the, with a metacarpal, remember the metacarpal is the bones of the hand. So the, this is the metacarpal of the thumb. And then here would be the first one of the eight carpals. But we could call this the carpo metacarpal joint. So anyway, uh, interphalangeal joints, just the joints between your phalanges. Okay, sternoclavicular joint. So atlanto-occipital, where the atlas and the occipital meet. Uh, atlanto-axial, where the atlas and the uh, axis meet. Okay, so again, a lot of the glenohumeral joint. So that's the glenoid fossa of the scapula and the humerus coming together. So anyway, uh, atlanto-occipital, there you go. Uh, ball and socket, again, we're thinking the shoulder and the hip. And then the gliding joints, uh, we see that uh, between, uh, not between vertebrae, but kind of lateral, where we have some movement of gliding going on uh, of, of some of the facets of your vertebrae. Okay. Uh, humeroscapular, I guess that's maybe the more common regular name. It used to be called the glenohumeral or the GH joints. You can see it's the glenoid uh, fossa of the scapula. But yeah, humeroscapula, that's pretty straightforward. This is called the labrum. This kind of glenoid labrum lends depth to the glenoid cavity. So the labrum is a, is a soft tissue um, and th that forms that cavity. And some folks, uh, repetitive use injuries, oftentimes it, it could even be an acute injury, you know, like somebody fell uh, off a ladder or something and they are there in a car accident and got got you know T-bone and their shoulder went up like this and you might get like a torn labrum. Uh, but we oftentimes see it, you know, from, from excessive shoulder use. I've had plumbers, uh, welders, uh, athletes, all kinds of different professions where uh, the labrum, the capsule uh, is, is shredded. All this soft tissue has been damaged. So um, you also have the rotator cuff muscles, which we'll talk about later, that surround this joint capsule. Elbow joint, again, you've got the humeral ulnar and, and radius. Okay. I'm not going to, so that's really, let me go to the, the, the hip joint and the knee joint next. So, uh, so again, you've got the big ball of the, of the head of the femur going into the acetabulum or the socket uh, of, the, of the hip bone. And again, you know, that socket, that acetabulum, that we look at here, okay, there's a, the word there, ace tab you lum. But yeah, this is the socket. That's actually, and here it is again, that's where all three hip bones converge. So when we look at the, the ilium, the ischium and the pubic bone or the pubis bone, that's where they all kind of converge and meet. So that acetabulum socket is, uh, is where all three bones combine. And again, it's a deep, very deep socket. By the way, that depth of that hip socket allows for, for, for good range of motion, uh, but it's pretty stable because of the depth and the amount, just the sheer amount of, of muscle and tissue and ligaments there. When we look at the shoulder though, let me bag up the wagons for a second. The shoulder, you know, it doesn't have as much and it's got, a, look at how shallow the socket is. See, here's the scapula, here's the bone. It's got a very shallow groove. So the shoulder is your most freely movable joint of the body, but it's also the most um, susceptible to uh, dislocations or subluxations or, or injuries. Yeah. 
Oh, by the way, osteoporosis is a condition where we usually see the bone density depletion, usually right in here, the neck of the femur. So grandma uh, falls and breaks her hip. Actually, usually what happens is grandma's bone density of, her, of the neck and head of the femur becomes so porous and diminished that the bone, the weight of the body uh, is enough, the weight pushing down on the hips, that's enough to cause it to break. So really it's the neck of the femur that breaks and then that would lead then to grandma falling. So we oftentimes will find them uh, at the bottom of stairs or at the top of stairs because you know there's a different range of motion, different muscle movement, different uh, points of emphasis for force uh, on, on the bone when we're, we're in those positions. So, uh, so usually, uh, like I say, you know, grandma doesn't fall and then hit her her greater trochanter hit her femur and then and it breaks usually like i say it's so porous that it actually breaks from from different force and movement uh, that's occurring and then that would certainly lead you to fall uh, down so anyway uh, that's your osteoporosis uh, side note so the knee we look at an anterior view and we can see what's called the anterior cruciate ligament. Cruciate means cross. So there's some sort of crossing going on here. So we have crisscross, anterior cruciate, and then posterior cruciate. These are the ligaments, especially the ACL, that gets torn uh, oftentimes uh, in some sort of uh, event, usually a twisting. Uh, usually it's planting of the tibia, and then the femur keeps moving either twisting, moving, or moving forward. Okay. Uh, let's see, meniscus. Again, you can see these little donuts here, these little, little uh, um, pads, meniscus. And then you have uh, ligaments out here. Laterally, you've got the You've got the lateral collateral ligament. They call it the LCL. We're starting to call it fibular collateral. We have lateral collateral and then medial collateral or MCL. Oftentimes a bad knee injury is going to lead to a tear of this ACL and then maybe some tears of the meniscus and then certainly some tears of these uh, collateral ligaments. So now when you sprain your knee or sprain your ankle, you're actually overstretching these ligaments here. Usually it's these. With the knee, you could have overstretched certainly the ACL or PCL, but usually the knee sprain is going to involve these external uh, ligaments. They have different degrees of sprains, S-P-R-A-I-N, sprains, different degrees. A first degree sprain is the, um, the, 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 best one usually that's the the smoothest sailing one a first degree is minor um you might have just stepped off the, the i was mowing the lawn just the other day two or three days ago uh push mower and i stepped uh kind of funny uh you know, my yard some spots is kind of grooved and and so anyway, I, I got a little first degree sprain. I've sprained my ankle. I played sports as baseball and basketball and football for many, many, many years. So I've sprained, uh, it just becomes part of what you're doing. So it just tweaked it for a, a split second. I just kept going and I kind of forgot about it uh, really. Uh, but that's just like a first degree type of sprain. Usually you don't, you might need a little ice, maybe ibuprofen or, or an Aleve or something. But then a second degree sprain, you might be getting into maybe a little bit of tearing of some of the soft tissue. Uh, so that might swell up a little bit, might even bruise a little bit. Uh, that definitely needs some ice and some rest and some, some elevation and just kind of get off your feet. Uh, now a third degree sprain might be a, a complete tear of the ligament and that that may require uh, some sort of procedure, hopefully not, but a third degree sprain is a really, really bad one. That one you're not going to be able to, you're going to be out of commission for probably a month, uh, maybe longer, uh, and it's going to require rehab and all kinds of stuff. So, yep. So anyway, first, second, and third degree sprains. I think we're good. This gets into range of motion, 
uh, so we can again if, if this if you're going into physical therapy um, occupational therapy um, athletic training orthopedic nursing injury rehab uh, post-op rehab this is a type of stuff you would get into so um, which I love I could talk about kine this is what they call kinesiology uh, the study of movement I could talk about and go through this all day but I'm not going to bore you to death with that stuff. I'll let you bore yourself to death uh, if you want more info on that. And then I have video lectures already done uh, of this uh, info, so you can certainly check those out. Um, let's move on to muscle. I'll just pull this up um, again. Like I say, visible body is kind of sketchy uh, when we're trying to do too much with Zoom. Up, oh, I'll try it again. Though I never know. Made it. All right, so moving into muscles, invisible body, oh, so far so good. So again, you've got the graded quizzes. That's what you're going to be graded on. So there are two graded quizzes. One is a muscle dissection quiz. The other one is a multiple choice quiz. So you do have a couple of those to do from the muscular system. Um, there are some lab, act again, you don't have to do any of the lab activities. You can if you'd like. Uh, there's also augmented reality. So that works best with uh, usually an iPad. Uh, I know some students have iPads. Uh, and an iPhone you could potentially do augmented reality with if you have the app for these. And again, I, speaking of which, I want to mention to get the most out of your visible body, again, you can click my apps and it does have um, several different apps. And again, these are you have access to these for life. So if you do want these and want to download these uh, and have them, you, you can do that at any any point, even you know five years from now, if you want. You have access to these uh, for life. You have access to this courseware for, I think, 12 months. So anyway, uh, probably one of the better ones is this, the Anatomy and Physiology app. Um, again, if you're getting into uh, physical therapy or, or uh, orthopedics, you'd maybe want to do that one there. Okay, so anyway, don't forget about those apps or forget about them or whatever. That's up to you. Uh, let's see. So lab activities, again, you don't need to do those. You can look at them if you'd like. There's some pathology info, uh, modules and practice quizzes. So this is where we're going to head. We're going to try and see if we can't get a few of these modules uh, or a few of these items uh, looked at. Now, first off, you know, we usually start, uh, it seems like we start with uh, um, kind of the cellular level and the tissue level. So um, we do quite a bit of physiology next semester. Uh, not quite, well, we do physiology the whole semester, but uh, <laughs> of muscles, uh, we do spend a little bit of time on physiology of muscle. Uh, because again, not just uh, to get the uh, to get your arms moving and your neck and shoulders and hips and all that, but but also to keep the heart moving and to keep your digestive tract moving. Yeah, it's already kind of slowing things down. Yeah, low system resources. I know. I was closing in some applications may help performance. Well, that's great. Okay. So here we go, muscle types. So we talked about skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. That's kind of the, where, where we were heading. So um, our goal really for this unit is skeletal muscle. We do spend some time doing uh, smooth and cardiac as the semester goes. We do see some, some different, again, going back to the histology or the tissue aspect, uh, we do see with cardiac muscle uh, striations. 
but we also have some different kind of connections and, and appearances than we do with skeletal muscle. By the way, uh, muscle has a lot, cells contain a lot of mitochondria, uh, and they're also uh, skeletal and, and cardiac are um, multinucleated. So you can have multiple nuclei, maybe for one muscle fiber. Okay. The distinguishing feature of cardiac muscle are these intercalated discs. Okay. So anyway, and then you've got more of a parallel arrangement of fibers with skeletal muscle, which is striated and voluntary. And then finally, smooth muscle, which is, again, most of your tubes of the body, they're, they're going to be non-striated and involuntary. And we also stated, okay, so one nucleus for smooth. And again, our goal is to really go through skeletal muscle. So you can see it's called skeletal muscle because it attaches to and connects with the skeletal system. A couple primary functions of skeletal muscle then would, would certainly be movement, uh, range of motion, locomotion, posture uh, is, is accomplished because of muscles. Uh, we also have heat production from muscles. Uh, we can store some energy there too. We primarily think of fats or lipids as our uh, storage uh, of energy. Muscle uses the energy, right? That's why there's so many mitochondria. So if you ever asked a question on an exam about, uh, you know, like a HESI or a, an NCLEX or even any of mine, if you ever asked, you know, which, um, which of the following contains the most uh, amount of mitochondria or the highest level or amount, anything with a lot of mitochondria. So what it's asking you is, your knowledge of what mitochondria are, first of all, remember they're the energy hub of a cell. So if we, if we have a, a, an organ that, that has a lot of mitochondria, the assumption would be that there's a, a need for a lot of energy. So uh, muscles need a lot of energy. So uh, the heart muscle is going to have a ton of mitochondria. So if you're given an option, uh, you know, or if you're given options, which you would be in a multiple choice uh, scenario of which of the following contains the most or highest level or number of mitochondria, just hit heart right away, heart. Uh, if heart's not an option, any muscle, skeletal muscle especially, so cardiac and skeletal muscle are full of mitochondria. So they're going to require the most energy, uh, whatever they're associated, whatever organ they're associated with. So anyway, smooth muscle, not quite as much in the mitochondria front, but still are going to be present. We see the GI tract, the respiratory tract, blood vessels, urinary, and reproductive. So basically, if it's a tract, I notice tract has a T at the end tract, not track with a K. Okay, a tract is basically a tubular network. Okay. So yeah, these are all tubes. Organs are either solid or hollow. So um, so the stomach would be like a, a hollow organ. The, the, the intestines are hollow organs. Whereas like the kidney, uh, you know, the, the liver, those are more solid organs. Just kind of as a side note. And of course, cardiac muscles, we have the myocardium. Okay, the myocardium. Myo means muscle, by the way. We had os or osteo means bone. Myo means muscle. Oh, that is good water. Ice mountain. Ooh, man, if you guys drink water, I hope you do. You should, uh, whether you're sick, healthy, uh, it doesn't matter. You should be drinking a lot of water, uh, probably oh, I don't know, like a quarter a gallon a day. So, you know, probably like 32 ounces of water a day, uh, up to 64. They used to tell us we need eight, eight ounce glasses a day. That's, that's a half a gallon of water. That's 64 ounces. A gallon is 128 fluid ounces. So 64 fluid ounces, uh, that's eight, eight ounce glasses of water. Uh, that's a half gallon. That's a lot of water. I mean, that's good. Yeah, if you can, if you can do it, you can take it. You can, you know, and you're integrating, uh, you know, a healthy diet with that. Excellent. Uh, but yeah, any amount of water is great. But man, one of my favorite uh, waters is Ice Mountain. It is so good. It's kind of weird, you know, because water does taste different, right? From water to water, like Deja Blue and uh, um, Dasani. Ooh, Dasani, I can hardly stand. Um, it's got almost like a 
plastic taste to it. And I think a lot of times these water places, they, whether it's the, the distributor, the supply chain, the, the, uh, the, the, the business that has the water, they leave that stuff sitting out in the sun. I think so they go to a gas station and I'll see these big piles of pallets of, of bottles of water sitting outside, just getting beat down by the sun. That's it's just nuts. So, so anyway, uh, drink, we'll, we'll take what we can get. Water is, is good for you. You need to drink lots of it. Oh, that's Christmas. Yikes. I'm Sam humming Christmas tunes already. Oh, brother. Okay. We need to keep her moving. Muscular anatomy. Uh, we've got a handful of, of items here. Head and neck, shoulder girdle, back, thoracic area, and abdomen. So th thorax generally means chest. We'll look at the, the chest and abdomen kind of together. Then we'll do a few pelvic and hip and then uh, upper limb, lower limb muscles. So muscles uh, can be kind of organized in the same way we organize the skeleton. We can have axial uh, muscles, appendicular muscles. So uh, let's take a peek at, at some, of the, uh, some of the other aspects of the muscular system two things a muscle needs in order to operate, right? So muscles have the ability to contract, they have the ability to relax, they have the, so they have the ability to be excited. So that means uh, we have nerve involvement. So uh, they have the ability to store some, some energy. They use a lot of energy, so they need a lot of, remember glucose is the primary energy source along with oxygen. So you have to breathe and you have to consume sugar. Woohoo, I can do both. So uh, if you're doing those two things, then you're giving your body uh, the, the uh, materials for, for energy. Um, so anyway, how do you get energy? How do you get those nutrients to the cells of the muscles? Well, you have to have a blood supply. So the blood uh, supply to muscles is generally pretty high, uh, as well as the nerve supply. Nerves are, are the, 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 the triggers for getting a muscle to contract. So in order to get excitability to lead to contractility, we need to have nerve involvement. So we look at the neuromuscular connection as well. Uh, so anyway, this is just showing uh, the pectoralis major muscle, okay, the pectoralis major. The muscles, by the way, they're named for shape, they're named for location, they're named for size, um, mo what movements they perform. This short video, uh, you, you can watch that. Now, action potential, cross bridge formation. This is all physiology, so you can kind of skim over that uh, for now, but know that you're going to definitely be inundated with some muscle physiology next semester. All right, again, innervation. So the brain and spinal cord to provide the, uh, so the brain and spinal cord, so this is, our next unit, by the way, is the nervous system. So this is kind of your, your lead in to, to seeing the nervous system, because we haven't really talked about it that much. We've talked a little bit about uh, nervous tissue as one of your four main tissue types. We looked at uh, the neuron briefly, but we haven't really gone into detail about the nervous system much. So we maybe talked a little bit about homeostasis the first week, uh, but generally, you know, this is kind of our first introduction to uh, going further with the nervous system. So the brain and spinal cord make up the central nervous system and off of the brain and off of the spinal cord, we have what are called nerves. They're called, so that's makes up what they call the peripheral nervous system. So, um, and then from there, the peripheral nervous system network is so nerves. So if you hear the word, so the basically the nervous system is only three things, brain, spinal cord, and nerves. That's it. Three, three things done. Well, within the nerve network, you do have specialized nerves. You have some nerves that are strictly sensory. So they're bringing information from either the internal world or the out side or external world, uh, they're bringing that, those stimuli uh, to the brain. Those are sensory nerves. And then you have what are called motor nerves. Motor nerves are, are going away from the central nervous system and, and sending messages out uh, to different muscles, whether it's smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, as well as glands. 
So we looked at endocrine glands uh, specifically uh, and a little bit of exocrine glands as well a few weeks ago. But glands uh, generally uh, are, are controlled also by the nervous system and by these by the motor uh, or the efferent pathway, we call it. So anyway, brain and spinal cord, peripheral nerves, these are called motor nerves that innervate muscle. So they call it like the motor end unit or the motor unit where a, where a nerve plugs into a muscle. When we look at the microanatomy of muscle, again, this is something that um, we would look at in more detail next, next semester, but I do want to mention this for sure. Uh, the outer covering of a muscle is called fascia, uh, and they also call it epimysium. And this epimysium is going to kind of coat the belly of the muscle. This is a tendon here. Uh, the tendon connects the muscle to the bone. Okay, so we've got the, the, the skeletal muscle here, tubes. So each of these bundles is called a fascicle. Okay, so you can see there says one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on, like maybe 25 different fascicles. So now what we do is we, let's pull one of these fascicles out, and you can see each one of these fascicles, of these tubes is called a muscle fiber. So this is, this is the fancy word for cell. So the cell of a muscle is called the muscle fiber. So each of these muscle fibers is going to contain nucleus, uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, um, uh, mitochondria, uh, sarcoplasm, which is cytoplasm. You can see fibers bundled form a fascicle. Fascicles bundled forms a muscle belly. All right, so let's break down the muscle fibers. We could probably stop there because a couple more little tidbits because next semester when we get to musculoskeletal uh, physiology, uh, we're going to be focused on this uh, micro scale, this cellular level. So inside of the cell, so remember a muscle fiber is a muscle cell just form, forming all these different proteins. And these proteins are called actin and myosin. Those are two of the, of the four or five proteins that form a muscle uh, fiber, a muscle cell. actin. It's a, what we call a double helix. You can see it's kind of two kind of like strings of pearls uh, or beads kind of twisted together. And then we have the thicker head or the thicker fascin, and they have these little golf club heads that attach to uh, the thin filament. So we get into this quite heavily next semester for at least a good one too much. But anyway, that's what we have to look forward to, how a muscle contracts. Smooth muscle, again, we're going to zip right past smooth and cardiac for now. Primarily because when we get to each of these body systems, we go through all of this uh, uh, info. So just know that if it's a tube or a tract, it's going to be smooth muscle. So you'll have epithelium lining the tube or the tract, and then you'll have connective tissue that connects the epithelium with the underlying uh, smooth muscle. Okay. Muscle attachments, a couple other. So, so back to skeletal, we made it through that. So in skeletal muscle, we're going to see a couple of terms uh, that, uh, that will help us understand body movements and attachment sites of the muscle. So again, we call this the belly of the muscle. And then what we're going to have are uh, also uh, that are the origin tendons typically are going to be more proximal or closer to the midline. And we're going to see those attached to some sort of bone. So origin is the muscle attachment that's usually more proximal. And it's also usually it's going to be the immovable part of the, of the joint or, or at least a very, very minimal amount of movement at the origin. So we want the origin to be very stable. And then we have the belly, and then we get to the, when we get to the insertion of the biceps, for instance, we're on the ulna and radius, and that's going to create the movement at the elbow. So as these fibers shorten, we're going to create muscle movement or contraction. Okay. Now a couple other, so the origins of the, of the biceps, and then the origins of the triceps. Tri means three, sep means head, so you have three origin heads. Biceps means two, so you're going to have two heads. So you're and then three. And then you have the tendon of the triceps coming down onto the olecranon. So the triceps, when those muscles contract or shorten, you're going to get extension of the elbow. These two muscles are what they call antagonists of one another. So basically what that means is when one is contracting or shortening, the other one is lengthening and relaxing. So if we're talking about flexion of the elbow, we would say the bicep and the triceps brachii is the antagonist. 
If we extend the arm back out or extend the elbow, we can say the triceps is the prime mover and the biceps is the antagonist. And then we have what are called synergists, which help the prime mover. So you can see there's a muscle flattened here called the, with the biceps, so they're synergist. And then we also have what are called fixator muscles and a fixed origin stabilize. They don't show any fixators here, but we do have some rotator cuff muscles uh, and some other muscles of the, the uh, scapula or stabilize the origin. So we call those fixators. Uh, this is a little bit of range of motion kind of physics. This is some kinesiology. So I don't think it's, I don't know if it's that, uh, this gets into the lever system, first degree uh, or first class lever, second class. I don't know if it's that, uh, that's, this is something you get that heavily involved with, but I'm going to talk about it briefly anyway. Um, we have uh, fulcrum, which is, so with the first class lever, it's like a teeter-totter. So what, so muscles work in, in a lever or lever type of system. So movement is, is happening across the joint. So typically we're going to have uh, some sort of weight or load. Okay? So the, the load in a first class lever or a teeter-totter is going to be on one end. And then the, the, the effort or the, uh, the movement has, is going to be the muscle shortening is going to occur at the opposite end of the load. Okay? So really it's important to just remember where the, what's, what's in the middle. So in a first class lever, the fulcrum is in the middle. So the load and the effort means is anterior to the fulcrum and in front of the fulcrum is a whole bunch of weight. And in order to keep my head from being down all the time, I have to put effort in the back uh, muscles of the neck to lift up the load. Okay? It's like a teeter-totter. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's a first class uh, lever. There aren't that many in the body. This is the primary one. First class levers are not that terribly common. Second class levers aren't that common either. Uh, we find one down in the lower uh, limb, down by the ankles when we stand on our tiptoes. So uh, again, the fulcrum, like the balls of the feet, they call it, um, the load is the weight of your body being put to, down through the tibia onto the talus. Okay? So the load is the weight. So if, if I need to elevate or lift this weight, so this is a wheel out here, and then I put the load in the wheelbarrow, how do I move the load? Well, I have to come over here and lift up the wheelbarrow, and then I can move the load. The muscles act as, as the, the effort or the lift that's needed to move the load. Okay? So load is in the middle with the second class lever. So that leaves a third. So we've had fulcrum in the middle, load in the middle. So the third class lever effort must be in the middle. Well, let's find out. Sure enough, effort is in the middle. These are the most third class levers, the most common lever uh, system in the body. Um, so what we do again, have, we have a fulcrum or some sort of joint. So in this example, it's the elbow joint. And then I put a load all the way out here in the hand. Yeah, I put a load here, I, I put a ball or a weight or something. And so effort needs to be applied or force, we call it applied force, needs to be uh, done uh, in between the fulcrum and the load to lift the load up. So that's what we have here. So the bicep muscles uh, are going to come and they're going to and uh, they're going to be inserted between the fulcrum and the load. And sure enough, there they are. So then if I shorten that, it's going to elevate or lift the load. Yeah. All right, let's look at a couple muscle specifics. Again, muscles are named for where they're located. They're named for what they do. Uh, so occipital frontalis also has an epicranius. This tells me it's part of the occipital bone and the frontal bone. So that's going to be your forehead muscle and then the back of the head muscle is connected by this aponeurosis or sheath. These other two you don't need to know. Orbicularis means circular or orbital muscle. Oculi relates to the eyeball. So orbicularis, oculi. Then we have orbicularis oris, which is the orbital sphincter kind of muscles around the lips or the mouth area. Orbicularis oris. Uh, zygomaticus, if you see that term, it probably relates to the zygomatic bone or the cheekbone. These other two, again, levator means elevates, labii, that means lips, superioris mean the tops. So you've got something that elevates the top lips, uh, and then elevates the mouth at an angle. Okay? And then again, you pr this is more of an exercise of just recognizing muscle names and then seeing maybe what they do or where they go. Again, I don't expect any of you to, to remember much of this. 
oops, buccinator, that's going to be uh, one of your primary muscles for, for chewing. We definitely get kind of a puckered lip. Buccinator means bugler. So, so like a bugle muscle. And then this one is the, your main chewing muscle. We'll see that's called the masseter. So again, you know, platysma, maybe you need to know that's like this kind of plate muscle. Yeah. Down in your superficial aspect of your neck. Oh, yeah. Eyeball muscles. Here we go. This is the masseter. That's a primary muscle for chewing. Mastication means to chew. So the masseter is a good one for that. And then we have this big temporalis muscle uh, that also closes the jaw, elevates the mandible. Elevate your mandible. We don't need to know. These are getting kind of again this gets there's the, the the idea of this exercise is just to see how how extensive and how massive muscle muscles are and also see some of their naming here's a couple that are good to know this first one is a big dog sternocleidomastoid that's a big muscle that so it tells you where it is sterno means sternum there it is clido means clavicle so sternoclavicular mastoid is this bump right behind the ear so you can see that muscle goes from the mastoid of the temporal of the temporal bone and heads down to the sternocleidal region or the sternoclavicular region. So we abbreviate that one SCM, typically sternocleidomastoid. Splenius capitus, that splenius means splint, capitus means head, or cap means head. So it's like a head splint. Keeps your head and neck kind of. Again, that's that applied force for the teeter totter. If your splenius capitis wasn't working or your, your uh, trapezius muscles weren't working, then your, your load would always be down like this. So we need those muscles to function to keep our head up. These scalenes, these are kind of hidden and embedded uh, in an area, but you can see they kind of come down on the ribs here. and kind of hidden in, in uh, below this uh, SCM and splenius capitis. But the scalenes uh, do a lot with elevating the ribs. Uh, the first couple pairs of ribs need to have elevation properties to make room for when we're taking deep inhalations. So uh, oftentimes uh, folks who do cardio work or exercise, especially they haven't done it in a while, and they do a lot of excess breathing, uh, they'll have some pain, kind of sharp pains around the lateral aspect of their neck right in here, kind of burning. That's the SCMs going through lactic acid. Uh, they're going through oxygen debt. So the, they're producing more lactic or let more lactic acid byproduct uh, is there. That's why you need to drink a lot of water to flush some of that out. But, uh, but anyway, some of that kind of sharp burniness that you get after doing a cardio work is because the scalenes are elevating the ribs over and over and over to make room for the lungs to expand. Or splenius capitis. Oh, these are called erector spinae, the whole group. So we'll just leave it at that. They help to make your spine erect. You can see there are a ton. So we're going to keep on going and then we'll have more fun. Let's see if we can ever get to the superficial muscles. That would be great. Here we go. So we've got uh, the four muscles of the abdomen. Um, the up and down uh, anterior abdominal group is called the rectus abdominis. Uh, let me click on that, rectus abdominis. So there it goes. So it'll highlight it specifically. So that's the six pack abs, the rectus abdominis. So they keep your abdomen erect. And then you have what are called the external obliques. Those are going to be the most superficial. You can see the muscle fiber direction goes in an oblique or angular fashion. 
Internal obliques are just underneath the external. So notice we took away the external. So then we have the internal obliques, also angular uh, muscle fiber direction. And then lastly, the fourth uh, muscle of the abdomen is the transverse abdominis. That's the deepest. And that you can see the muscle fiber directions go in a transverse uh, plane there. And so uh, these help to kind of keep your, your abdominal contents uh, contained. So those are the four abdominal muscles. Those are the four bacon muscles too. So the abdominal, four abdominals of the pig are what give us bacon. Just again, as a side note. Let's keep moving. So we're, we're sticking to all of these axial muscles, as you can tell. We'll get into the appendiculars in a second. Uh, this group is an important group. You've got one of the largest muscles of the body, the diaphragm, uh, forming a complete wall between the abdominal cavity and the thoracic cavity. And you can see these big tendons here. They actually kind of pull the uh, diaphragm down. And in the lungs, uh, that uh, parietal pleura of the lungs are attached to the superficial aspect of the diaphragm. So when the diaphragm contracts or pulls down, it actually pulls the lungs with it, thus in increasing the volume of the lungs uh, and decreasing the pressure. And air always goes to where there's less pressure. So once we increase the volume of the lungs, we can de we get a decrease in pressure. So then that outside air will, will go into the lungs. So the diaphragm is responsible for about three quarters of the muscles needed to, to encourage uh, proper breathing. In fact, a deep breath is called uh, diaphragmatic breathing. Ah, there's a good one. All right, external intercostals, those also help with the breathing and elevating and expanding the rib cage so the lungs have more room uh, when they're inflating. And then the internal intercostals come into play when we're, when we're exhaling or kind of bringing the ribs back uh, to where they started. All right, a couple of other muscles we, we see on the, uh, the axial portion of the body. We have these serratus muscles. Serrated is like a knife, right? Like serrated edge. So we have, that's where they get their name, serratus. Anterior means they're toward the front. And then we have this muscle underneath the pec major is the pec minor, pectoralis minor. So we removed that big pectoralis muscle and, and uh, left behind the pectoralis minor. And you see subclavius, so underneath the clavicle, right? subclavius. All right, another nice large muscle uh, of the, it's kind of your upper back and shoulder cape called the trapezius muscle. Yeah, that's this muscle of the shoulder. So whenever you get a little shoulder massage, that's what that is. There's, we're working on the trapezius. Hey, if we peel away the trapezius, we end up with the, uh, we're gonna hide it. Let's see. There we go. So it hid the trapezius for us. So the rhomboids are gonna attach to the medial portion of the scapula. They're gonna bring your shoulders back. So when they say stand up straight, but shoulders back, that's the rhomboids that bring your shoulder blades back. Then we have this guy, the levator scapulae that elevates the scaps, lifts up your shoulder blades. So this is like a fear protection kind of muscle. So if the bear is coming at you or you need to protect something, or if we have a lot of anxiety and fear, we definitely uh, get these levator scaps going. And what that can do over time is lead to bone spurs and all kinds of issues uh, along this, the vertebral column. You can see what they plug it up here as well as along that, uh, that superior angle of the scap. Then we have rhomboid minor, the little guy, uh, at the more superior aspect of the rhomboids and shoulder blades. All right, that takes us to the chest area. Again, we have pectoralis major, the big muscle of the chest. And then we have the, the deltoid. We have the anterior deltoid, the middle deltoid, and the posterior deltoid. We just need them as a group. So that's the big... Uh, so any nurse or medical practitioner would definitely want to know where the deltoid is located. That's where we do a lot of intramuscular injections, right? So the middle deltoid is a hot spot for uh, IM shots. And then the lats, the latissimus dorsi, that's kind of the lower body cape. So you have the trapezius is the upper body cape, the lats are the lower body cape. And what they do is they kind of plug into the armpit area. They're the antagonist for the pectoralis. You have pec major and latissimus both plugging into the same spot. So pec major is going to kind of bring some forward uh, motion, uh, uh, extension, or, or, or I should say a shoulder flexion. 
uh, it's also going to, and, and uh, the lats are going to do some uh, shoulder extension. Uh, they both are, by the way, the deltoid helps with abducting the arm, whereas the pec major and the latissimus help to add uh, the arm back. All right, we're just about done. Uh, the rotator cuffs, you have SITS principle for the rotator cuff, S-I-T-S, supraspinatus, above the spine of the scapula muscle, infraspinatus, below the, scap below the spine of the scapula muscle, teres minor, kind of uh, embedded and, and blended right in. So you have supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and then subscapularis, uh, underneath the scapula going to come in and, and help. So these are all your rotator cuff muscles. Then we have a teres major that kind of plugs into the armpit. Okay, sits, S-I-T-S. There they are. Yeah, we did biceps brachii. Okay, and then underneath or deep to that is the brachialis muscle. And then lateral, brachioradialis. And brachia means upper arm, radialis means the radius. So brachioradialis. Again, bone uh, or muscle names. To, so that's why it's good to know the skeleton before you do the muscles because uh, anyway. Triceps, so the antagonist. You don't need to know any of the forearm muscles. Just know the anterior group are called flexors. You can see the word flexor in front of all those. So anterior muscle groups of the forearm are flexors. So posterior muscle groups of the forearm are called extensors. You don't need to get to, oh, there they are. You can see all those words, extensor, extensors. Then it tells you what they extend. So that's the, the posterior aspects of extensors and flexors. All right, let's get out of the arm area and head down to the midsection. We have a couple muscles that are deep called the psoas major and minor, as well as the iliacus. Again, ilium, iliacus. So this forms the iliopsoas group, and that goes down onto that lesser trochanter of the femur. So this helps with some of it, some body range of motion of the hips, locomotion, movement of the hip joint. Um, and yeah, you can see some, some of your lower back issues. If you've got inflammation of any of these psoas muscles, it can affect the nerve flow. Then we've got the gluteal group, gluteus maximus, one of the largest muscles of the body. And then gluteus medius is kind of your deltoid of your hip area. And then we have this TFL, tensor fascia lata, with the long, what we call the IT band that goes from the ilium all the way down to the tibia. So TFL and IT band, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and then underneath all of that is gluteus minimus. We don't really need to get into these. Maybe piriformis. This is one that some people, the sciatic nerve actually passes through the piriformis. You can see that the, the sciatic notch uh, is here from, from the ilium right back in here. So the sciatic nerve passes through down back through this area and, and through, uh, supposed to go uh, through, not through the muscle, but in front of or behind the muscle, and then uh, travel posteriorly. But again, it's in, I don't know, 10, 15 percent of population, the sciatic nerve actually uh, does kind of get, uh, goes through that piriformis. That can make for chronic sciatic or low back issues. Okay, the quads, you have four quadricep muscles, the vastus group, vastus uh, lateralis, vastus medialis, then underneath rectus femoris is vastus intermedius. So anyway, you've got the, this is the quadriceps group. One, two, three, and the fourth one's buried under all of this. Then we have this longest muscle in the body, sartorius, the longest muscle of the body. This helps to cross your leg over. It's what they call the Taylor muscle. So anyway, here are the quads, rectus femoris. Vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and then vastus intermedius is underneath rectus femoris. Okay, and then your groin region, those are just called the adductor group. So we'll just leave it at that. Adductor group is the, the groin area. Then you have 
uh, again, there's the adductor group, adductor brevis, longus, and magnus. All right, and then we'll look at the back of the thigh or the hamstring muscles. You have three hamstrings, so four quadriceps, three hamstrings. You have the biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus. So the two semis go together and come medially, whereas the biceps femoris goes laterally out to the fibula. So anyway, three hamstrings, four quads. We're almost there, guys. Tibialis anterior, that's the front of the shin. Those are what give our patients shin splints. A lot of runners have shin issues. You can see where that uh, tibialis anterior goes and plugs in. Beat it, Betty, bop, bop. There it is. So if we've got poor footwear going on uh, with a runner or a walker, there we go. So if we've got um, this first metatarsal is kind of sagging, that can pull on this. And if you have poor uh, arch support or even too much, I've seen I've had folks who have too much arch support. So it's pushing on uh, this area of the tarsal group. And then that, that can alter how this uh, tendon uh, is behaving. And then it can put undue pressure and strain on the tibialis anterior muscles. And then lastly, we're going to have the back of the lower leg. You have the calf muscles called the gastrocnemius. And then just underneath that, uh, you're going to have what's called the soleus muscles. So the gastroc and the soleus form what we call the Achilles tendon. Hmm. And then you just have a whole bunch of other muscles uh, of, the, of the lower leg and the feet. All right, that is a wrap for muscles, guys. And boom, it takes us right to the nervous system. Okay, so I'm going to get out of visible body. Back. Okay, so that's your muscular system. So we've done skeletal and muscular. Next week, we're going to get into nervous system, but we're going to, we're going to be in class next week. We'll be on campus. Um, I want to go through some bones and muscles uh, in person first. That won't take long, maybe a half an hour. And then we'll give you a little overview of the nervous system. And then we'll dissect the sheep brain and the cow eyeball. That usually takes about a half hour, 45 minutes. So, <clears throat> so anyway, that's the plan for next week. You guys have questions uh, at the moment? If not, see you uh, in class on Tuesday. If you're not going to be there, uh, please email me and let me know. Um, I may be able to fire up Zoom and, and do some stuff that way, uh, kind of multitask, you know, kind of, imper but uh, um, anyway, Zoom doesn't always work well in the classroom, sometimes it does. So anyway, but yeah, I can, we can always do it that way if you're not comfortable coming onto campus or if you just can't make it or whatever. But again, the kind of the point is to be able to touch, see, hold, and, and do. So I, I don't, I probably won't Zoom uh, next week or record or anything. So just come to class. We'll go through some models and dissect the sheep brain and go from there. You guys have a good week. Thanks, you too. Thanks, Maria. Thanks. Have a good week. Yep, I will. You too. Thanks, Biggie. Thanks, Carrie, Julia, Sky. Oh, and Sky, uh, I'll be uh, for for tonight. It's uh, totally optional, but I'm going to be open in Zoom at five thirty or so for anybody who has questions or you know. I know a few students have emailed me about the grad ready and some of the other stuff. For, so thank you. I will. Um, so, so anyhow, you don't have to log in or anything, but if you have questions or comments or concerns, uh, I'll, I'll open it up at 530. There probably won't be hardly anybody there. And if they are there, they won't be there long. So just okay. know that that's the deal for, for gateway to success. Okay, sure. And are you doing, um, classes for gateway success, success, um, in person today too, or is it just the zoom? No, I'm just going to do zoom and I'll send okay, out an announcement good. reminder. So I think last week, I think uh, five people, I think both weeks, five students came to campus 
the same mm -hmm. five. So they know, uh, but I'm going to send out an announcement reminder that that okay. I will uh, be open in Zoom. It's uh, it's optional. You don't have to come. More more or less, kind of a check in, kind of study hall type type deal. Perfect. So some students still need you know strengths, uh, grad ready, and smarter measure. Those are the big three that you need to have done. So okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Yep. You're welcome. Have a good one. You too. Okay.